if you save a file called new.c4d in your default uh, cinema folder, every time you open up cinema, it'll open up with that. And what does that really mean? For a lot of people, it doesn't mean that much because it's like if I make a new file, maybe you know, like if you're using the same kind of objects all the time, like if you always start with a square and you always want to open up a cube, that seems like not that big of a deal. But for me, what I love doing is a couple of things. So Cinema defaults at 30 frames per second, and I'm in Europe for the first time, so that makes a lot more sense for people. But if for me, I'm almost always working on film stuff, and it's always 24. I can't tell you how many times I work with freelancers, and there's multiple places to change your frame rate in cinema, which people don't realize. But I always end up having to go 10 minutes into working on a project, two days later working on a project, change my frame rate. So whenever I'm working with multiple people, um, I try to set up their files as well before they start up, so there's just like a base level. I change my frames per second by default to 24. And just so you know, I don't know if people realize this also, if you do that, you also need to make sure that you change your frame rate here to 24. And also, if you're ever um, doing, I'm trying to think where it's at, there's one other place. If you go to make preview, and if you ever are making quick times, um, if you do a quick time instead of an AVI, you have to remember to also change it to 24 here. So there's three places where you could completely screw up your frame rates. And if you're doing anything animation timing specific, it's easy to mess this up. So if you change these settings before you ever get going and save yourself a new .c4d file, um, it's really helpful. For me, I also change, I hate the fact that it defaults to 72 frames, so I give myself 10 seconds. Um, let's see, what else is in here? I don't know how many people know about this, but when I animate, I don't like to have the computer decide my or my ease in and ease out of my curves. So I default to linear, which is right by my head, so I apologize. I default to linear so my computer isn't doing any in-betweening for me. I, I tell it how I want it to move. I don't want the computer to do it. Um, and normally what that means is every time I set keyframes, I have to go back to the timeline and change my keyframes back to linear. If you do it this way, it'll always default. There's another thing in here called overdub that, how many people animate a lot in Cinema 4D? So when you're animating, have you ever had something where you set up a very specific ease out, you've played with your tangent handles, and then you change a value on that time, and then all that easing you did disappears, and you have to go back and do it? I didn't know this, it drove me crazy. If you turn on overdub, if you've changed that handle so that you have a slow ease out and then it snaps off, but you need to change the value in the, t in the viewer, if you turn overdub on, it will always keep that same tangent handle. It won't blow that out. So I also try to make sure that I do this. But the one thing for me that I, I tell people all the time and they get surprised by, that I love changing the preset to. And I'm gonna apologize now. You're gonna see much more beautiful things from other um, people. This is gonna be mostly cubes and spheres, um, but it's mostly just to try to explain the, the tools. Um, the viewport OpenGL has gotten a lot better in Cinema 4D with R16. But one thing that frustrates me all the time is, no matter where I'm looking, if I don't have a light in my scene, I have this really flat, boring file. Let me see, I'm gonna bring, open up another file for you guys. This guy you'll see quite a bit um, I think he's in here. So my favorite dinosaur of all time is a Stegosaurus. Um, so I'm going to use him a lot. But the thing I don't like about this is that if I don't have any lights right now, he's kind of really boringly lit. But cinema always has some type of lighting in your scene. So even if there isn't a light so that it's not dark out, you have this default light, but it's kind of boring. It's almost like you have a headlight on top of your camera and it's just shooting straight out. What I like to do in all of my scenes is actually have a little bit of a top light just by default so that it's not flat, that I can actually see the um, lines. But every time I open up a new cinema file, I have to reset that default light over and over. So whenever I'm doing a new .c4d file, this is one of the things I set up as well. If you save that along with everything else in your project settings, every time you open up cinema, you'll have your default light set up. So you don't have to remember where it's at and what the, uh, the lighting was. So let's see. I'm not going very fast for trying to do 50, um, so I'm on two. So custom render presets. Another thing that we have a problem in, in working in a team situation with cinema is that people will just render whatever they want. They'll render different settings. They'll render with different, um, different um, settings for quality. Um, and we try to control that. But what happens is a lot of people don't have presets. So one of the things that I really liked about um, other programs is that I could basically create a suite or a package of render settings, set them up, and then just give them out to the rest of my teams. So the whole idea is, again, for working smarter, I think I said it here, never render more than what you need. And what I mean by that is that while I'm working, I don't need to um, render full resolution every single frame at, um, 
the quality because I might just be looking at my lighting or I might just be looking at positioning for um, camera work. So if I'm always rendering at 1920 by 1080 and I have everything set up, I'm almost always using physical. Um, it doesn't make sense to have everything set to like medium or high. So we actually build out settings that are pretty awful when we're rendering. And I'll take this up to like 50%. All of my subdivisions dividing will always be done at something really low. And I'll make a new render preset that we always call at work hack and slash. So whenever I'm rendering, I can have some really bad render settings, but I can render really, really fast. Um, and then if I ever need to go and set up something specific, we don't like really relying on these presets all that much because they, they're actually, um, a for us, they're a little heavy handed. So like when I'm working, depending on what I'm doing, I'll end up making custom presets, not 54. Um, a, a quick tip, if you're ever rendering and you're just trying to eke out a little bit more time, like say your renders are taking 20 minutes and you want to try to get them down to 10 or 12, if all you ever do is go from, I forgot what it's set, medium is set to five, try setting your shading error threshold from like five to something fairly large, like 20. Double check a couple of frames in succession to see if you get any noise, because you can play with the shading error threshold, which sounds like nothing, and get um, fairly significant render uh, benefits from it. Um, the other thing that we end up doing is that I feel like at a default, a lot of these settings are really high. So I'll bring these down. But what this basically means is that if I have this render setting and I'm working on a team of 10 people, if I'm getting these benefits but the other nine people aren't, it's kind of a pain. So what will end up happening is I'll make these render presets and we'll save them off, distribute them to the team, and then everybody will work with the same render presets. Um, also as part of that is the, the file paths. If you want to kind of control where people are saving and what they're saving their file names as, the render presets that you can distribute to people help out a lot to make sure that um, people are working in the same method all the time. This is one that I wish one of, the, um, one of our developers from the Cinema team was actually here because I, I don't know why this is off by default, but if you've ever used Cinema, there's tons of... Um, commands, right? And they're all pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But the only thing that's kind of difficult is, and this happens to me all the time, now that we have the polypen tool, which I don't know if everybody knows about, I'm trying to use a lot more modeling tools in cinema, but I'm trying to memorize where all the presets are. If you're just, for the people who are just starting out, it's kind of frustrating because there's a very great um, command, or a command tool for finding where all these shortcuts are. Like, let's say I wanted to figure out what polypen's shortcut was. You can search really easily and find different things. So polygon pen, and I realize that there's a shortcut. But the thing that's frustrating is that if you don't have that open, how would you know what that is? But there's a little secret. If you go into your preferences, this is another thing when I'm bored for renders to come out. I sit and spend a lot of time looking through the preferences. For some reason, this little guy, show shortcuts in menu, is turned off, which I don't understand. Because as user um, friendly and as intuitive as cinema is, the shortcuts are hidden. So if you turn this on automatically, all your shortcuts show up all of a sudden. So if you're learning cinema, it's probably the very first thing I would do is before you do a new file, turn that on automatically. All right. So there's another thing in here. So quick storage, creating a personal color system, which sounds a little bit weird. Um, in cinema, there are a lot of hit tools hidden away. And I found this out when I was just trying to set up colors. So Say I have this yellow, and I want to basically use this yellow in multiple materials, or I want to use it in multiple places in cinema. What would I have to do to remember it, other than the fact that it's a basic yellow, if this was a specific color? I guess I would have to remember 255, 255, 0 every single time I ever input that into a file. Um, but again, one of the things I encourage people to do all the time is to just kind of play around in the interface. I had no idea what this little um, arrow button was, but one time I hit it, and I saw all this stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. Enhanced color table. That sounds good. And I started going through all the different numbers, and I saw show quick storage. I was like, whoa, what does that mean? What it basically means is that if you ever want to have 10 to 15 different colors that you can call up all the time without remembering hex codes or RGB codes, you can basically have these. Um, but the thing that's kind of frustrating with that, let's see, if you change it there, the quick storage will be there. But if you want quick storage to show up everywhere inside Cinema 4D, you have to go to preferences, and let me see if I can remember where it's at. I think it might be under units. So for one thing, you saw that enhanced color table that was there. It's not in every single spot where you can pick up color. But by default, you can tell it to turn on. And you can also have quick storage. So anywhere in cinema, you can always have those little chips that stay persistent every single time you open. What's good for me is that what I like to do, and let me see if I can open my 
remember I, I mentioned the new.c4d file. I think I brought mine with me. Um, one thing I like to do is that I like to use the same colors for the same things in as many programs as possible. So you guys said you're After Effects users. You know how you have your default colors for different things? I go back and I change those to specific things. So in every one of my files that I ever open up for the last four or five years, my cameras I try to make always green, my lights I always try to make yellow, nulls I always try to make black. Um, and then if I have my quick storage, I can always have the same colors in After Effects, in Cinema, anywhere I would be working, and I can refer to them. Even if you want to like try out a color, this is a good place to kind of talk about the interface. Um, Cinema's interface is really malleable. But one thing I really don't like is um, if I select one object and I have children, it highlights those children. But I don't like how they're basically the same color. I can't really differentiate which one's the parent from the child. Um, so first off, if I go to project settings, I think, no, I'm sorry. If I go to viewport, I can actually tell it, I don't really, I know it's a new feature that people seem to like, but outlines, I don't know how many people use those outlines. Like whenever you actually highlight over something, you can see that it outlines it. Um, in previous versions, if you have a large scene, um, we worked on Pacific Rim last year, which meant we had these huge robots with tons and tons of geometry. And every time I'd mouse over as I would be rotating, the whole screen would kind of slow down a little bit. One of the first things I did was that I just turned off outlining because it's a little frustrating for me. It's a good feature, but I, I don't really care for it all that much. But at the same time, you can see how when I pick this object, these other children are slightly less white, which is kind of frustrating. Um, I can tell it to not include children when it highlights, but I really like that feature. I just kind of want to find a way to change that. So if I go into Edit and Preferences, how many people have actually played with the, the colors in the editor? Probably not many people. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can change. One of the things I really like is that I'm kind of an addict for um, darker interfaces. And one of those things are I can actually go in and start changing my gradient just to make it almost as dark as I can. But then I kind of have this problem where sometimes the, the grid itself isn't dark enough. And then I realize, like, oh, I can actually make the differences between my major and minor grids a little bit more um, exaggerated. But then I think, if I can remember where it's at, Let's see if I can find children. So I have activation polygons and activation polygons children. I like to go in and actually change that so that I can see my interface and set something up so that if I actually am using the highlighting, I can see which one's the parent and which ones are the children. This doesn't seem like that big of a deal. When you're working with someone and you're clicking around and everything looks the same, let's say like a giant robot that has 8,000 screws, I want to see what the parent is and what the children are. This makes it a lot easier to highlight. So again, it seems small, but these are all things that help you work a little bit smarter and uh, a little bit faster without having to work so hard. So let's go to the next one. Show colors in Object Manager. Um, this keeps me from going absolutely crazy when I have large scenes. And I kind of gave a little hint of it in that last file. Um, but what this lets you do is, let's see. What this lets you do is you can change your colors in your object manager. And this is my new.c4d. Every time I open up Cinema, I have a couple of these things in here, except for I don't have cubes all the time. But I have these nulls, and I always have them colored black, just so that when I open up my um, scene, I have these things that are basically like organization tools, that they don't render. They're never used for hierarchies. They're never parented. But they're just basically ways for me to file things away. So if any time I make a camera, and this is something I try to enforce at, my, at the office when I'm working with other people. I always know my cameras, if I have 20 of them, if I have one of them, they're always the very first thing at the top of my object manager. So I don't have to look through and highlight a bunch of different things. Same thing with my lights. Anything that's in my scene, I always try to put there. And then this is a tip I learned from Tim Clapham. I always put my effectors at the bottom. Because people don't realize this, but Cinema actually evaluates the scene from the top and works it all the way down to the bottom. So you can, if you don't have your effectors at the bottom of your chain, Sometimes things um, won't necessarily show up on screen the way you'd want them to, timing-wise. But getting back to this idea, um, if I go here, this is a new feature, I think in 13 or 14. Um, because I've only been using Cinema for two years, the other thing I love to do is go back and look at reviews of old versions of Cinema. Because there are tons of tools that people don't know about um, that they're there and people never actually like, take advantage of. So one of the things I saw is that normally when you make a new null, they show up, and there's no color. There's nothing going on. Um, but if I turn this on, I can say use color. But that should just change it in the viewport. But um, if I turn on like this guy again, if I turn on icon color, you can see it actually changes in the viewport. So again, going with your personal color system, I couldn't think of a better word for it. This helps you kind of create a visual hierarchy in your um, object manager, which is really nice. Let's get back. 
kind of going hand in hand with that is custom defaults. And this goes back to that thing I was talking about, not doing dumb things over and over and over. Having used 3D Studio Max for a little while, um, one of the things that I loved was that nulls were very much not just a organizational object, but they, were, they give you visual feedback in the viewport. So I would use nulls all the time in cinema, and I'd get really frustrated because by default, they're basically invisible. Um, but what I would end up doing, and let's, I could count the amount of mouse clicks that this takes, I would almost always go to the object. I change it into a point so I'd get this little cross. But then in cinema, the cross always stares at you, so I'd have to go and change it to be an XY. The size is always a little bit too small. And then I do that thing I just talked about where I would make it green because I came from cinema. And every time I ever used a null, I'd find myself doing this over and over and over until I found, where is it at? Been here. There is a spot that I'm missing. I'll have to go back and find it because there's a spot here where I can actually make the object a preset so that just like I have a new.c4d file, you can force any object you'd make, whether it's a sphere, whether it's a character object, to default to your settings. So you can always have it come back up, and that every time I create a new null, it'll always show up as this XY, it'll be green, it'll be 25. Um, I have to figure out where it's at, which for some reason, it's not showing up the way I'm used to seeing it. I'll find this out and tell you guys at the end of the, the I don't want to slow down. Um, the other thing, I don't know how many people customize your interface, but I use nulls all the time, whether I'm doing character animation or I'm doing MoGraph stuff. Um, and what I end up doing all the time is, let's pull this off. I end up pulling extra tools into my interface so I don't have to go and click and drag every time. So if you go to Window, Customize Commands, and if you turn on this little button, Edit Palettes, everything goes active. You can actually take any of these and drag them into your interface. So now I've made it so that my nulls, once I figure out where that button was actually at to save the object default, um, let's see, let me actually do it. It's down here, actually. So if I go here and I say Edit, Set as Default, we just say yes. And if I delete this, every time now that I make a null in my new shelf object, it's going to show up with those presets, which is nice. I don't have to do those six or seven clicks just to get this thing to show up. All right. Active Tool and HUD. So um, one of the things I missed from a couple other softwares is that I could see the most recent things that I've uh, most recent tools I've used, and I couldn't find anything like that in Cinema. There is. Um, this drop down that shows your tools that you've used, but it's kind of cumbersome to have to go from wherever you're working, if you're in the object manager, in the um, viewport, to have to come up here, click and drag and hold. Um, and as I was searching around, I found out if you go into view, is it options? You can either configure your view for just this specific view or for all views. So if I do configure all, there's this list of stuff that you can actually put in the HUD. Um, and there's a bunch of great things. By default, I always put my camera so I can see which camera I'm actually working with. So right now I'm on three instead of eight. Um, scope statistics is on for some reason. I don't really use it very often. Um, frames per second is great, so that I can kind of evaluate my playback. One thing you should never trust with any 3D program, but especially cinema, is that if you hit play, make sure that it's actually running at least as high as the speed that you're rendering at. A lot of times I'll be animating, and I won't notice that I'll be running at like 18 or 20 frames per second, and then I'll render, and all of a sudden it's going twice as fast as what I thought it would be in the final. Um, so frame per second is great, but the best one out of all of these is uh, Active Tool. And if I, now if I'm working and I just want to go and swap back to one of the tools I've used before, I can just click and drag, and then they come up right here so I can switch. So if I was using the Move Tool, Scale Tool, any of these, now I think up to eight will show up down here. So there is a keyboard shortcut where if you, if you hit the space bar, it doesn't toggle between your m most recent and your last used. It toggles between the um, selection tool and your most um, recently used tool other than the selection tool. But if you're using, like, in modeling, you could be using the poly pen, you could be using the knife tool. Um, it's nice to just say the same last three or four tools are all available here. And it's kind of hidden away. I didn't know about that. So just so you remember, again, it's under options. And if you do configure and HUD, there's a bunch of things in here. There's statistics for when you're modeling. Um, but active tool, this guy, is the most valuable one that I know of. So project settings presets, um, these are great if you can actually figure out where they're saved. But going hand in hand with what we talked about before, um, if I go to my project settings, and I, you, I talked about how you could save out that new.c4d file. If different people work different ways, but you want to be able to have everybody use the same um, project setting preset, so the fact that it's 
200 frames long, or the fact that you're 24 frames per second versus 30 or 60. Um, what you can do is you can save a preset, which is nice. Um, and then anytime people are coming in, they can go and find it. But for some reason, to find out where it's actually saved so you can put it on multiple people's machines, it's kind of hidden away. Um, and you have to go to the content browser. And if you never save that preset, um, it's a little f infuriating. So if you go to presets, normally pretend user wasn't here. The moment you actually save a preset, then this little user window comes up. And if you double click on that and project setting presets, then you can see all these additional presets, which you can save these and distribute to everybody else working on your team. So you know when they start, they have to load this preset and then they'll all be uh, synced up. There's nothing worse than working on a project with like eight people and having one guy working on 24 while everybody else is working at 30 and having to go back and figure out where all those keyframes should have been or where they go. It's a really big pain in the butt. So if you can start off, Cinema has the tools to kind of manage it. They're just kind of in the background. So now you know where they're at. All right, so this one kind of hits close to home. Um, it's kind of specific, but it goes back to kind of the way you set your scene files up. How many people use displacements in Cinema 4D? You, get, you use the sculpting tool and you create displacement maps so that you can have all your data. Um, we have a render farm that's not that big, but it's about 30 nodes, I think, 30 or 40. The reason I say don't spend Saturday working on the farm, because we were working on a project. I think it actually was one of these that I showed. Um, let's see. It was for a game called Elder Scrolls Oblivion. So it was a couple years ago. But it was these, like, where are they at? It was these, like, metal dragons that had a ton of detail, and we thought we were going to be really cute and really smart somewhere in here. Um, but it has a lot of sculpting detail, basically. And we had a guy, actually, it was before the sculpting tool was around, this guy. So these were using tons and tons of displacement maps generated out of ZBrush. So it was before we had the sculpting tools. So the, the actual files themselves were huge. Um, and we would try to render them on our regular machines, and they'd render really fast, blazing fast. And then we'd send them to our farm, Instead of it taking 10 minutes a frame, they were taking two and a half hours a frame, and they weren't even finishing. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. So we probably spent one whole day reevaluating the scene files, trying to find ways to fix it. And then right before I left on Friday, I happened to go, again, I was bored, waiting for a render to finish. And I went to preferences. And I started just literally like hitting every button, like, what could it possibly be? And I got to memory. And I saw this thing called Renderer Displacement 512. We had like four gigs worth of textures that we were trying to render, but we were only letting Cinema use half of a gig, which is insane. So it meant that instead of using all that RAM that you have on your machine, it was using half a gig and then loading that stuff to the hard drive and just thrashing back and forth and back and forth. So one of the first tips I could tell you on top of what I said earlier is that if you have 16 gigs of RAM on your machine, change this to 4,000 like automatically right away so that you don't spend Saturday working on the farm because that's what I did. I literally had to go into my render farm and log into every single machine, go to this, put in 4,000, close it, restart it to make sure it's stuck, and then do that like 30 times over and over. So if you have an IT guy, make him do this like on Monday, because it's great. Um, so it'll actually dramatically reduce your render time, and it's a simple thing. The other thing I would say is if you haven't been using displacements lately, I think it was, I don't know if you'll know, Andres, 14, R14 or R15, the last thing on the list of new features, and it didn't even have one of those little buttons to tell you more, is it said displacements have been tweaked to be faster. One of the versions in the last two years or three years, if you use displacement maps, render times have increased dramatically is not even the right word. I don't know what magic was done, but the way it processes displacement maps, I went back on that Elder Scrolls thing after they said that and just tried to render it to see what it would do. And I think it went down from like 15 minutes to like five and a half minutes or six minutes, changing nothing other than opening it in a new version that had whatever coding was done with displacement maps. So which one do you think it was? 15. So for anybody who's on R13 or 14 and you're using displacement maps, it's time to upgrade. Um, honestly, I would legitimately say if you use them a lot, that's, that's one small change. It's worth it just to upgrade for that. And that's not hyperbole. The amount of time it saved us was huge. All right. So custom actions, channel your inner Photoshop nerd. How many people use Photoshop? I hope everybody who has to do this stuff, right? Everybody? Um, how many people do actions, though? How many people have like 20 things that they have to do a bunch of times and then save it and then just hit play? Um, I didn't know this, but there's basically the same ability to do that inside Cinema 4D. Um, but it was in a window that I'm scared to death of ever opening ever. And it's in the script window. This normally isn't, you would think, for artists. But um, there's a couple things that are great that are in here. There's one thing called Script Manager. And let's see if I remember which one it is. And I think it's, they're weird names. There's also Script Log. 
10 minutes? Great. Wow, that's really slow. Um, so there's script log, which is great. Um, and I don't understand Python at all, even less than I understand coffee, even less than I understand JavaScript. So the first thing I do, which it is awesome we have Python, for people who know it, I switch to coffee, just because it seems simpler and it's more straightforward when I'm working. Um, but I had somebody ask me, if you're using After Effects, everybody knows that like, I think it's um, page up and page down. I think if you hold Alt or Shift, it goes 10 frames instead of one frame. And I had a bunch of people that were working with me. They're like, how do I just skip 10 frames all the time? And I was looking through the, the shortcuts. I couldn't find it anywhere. But I was like, man, maybe this is the one time I actually could script. So I, I had this brilliant idea once I got this stuff working, where I was like, OK, I'm going to hit, um, what is it to advance a frame? Who even knows? I don't even have to remember the shortcut. But I just hit it five times. I'm like, OK, cool. This script log is basically a listener. So it's just listening to what you're doing. And I didn't tell the guy who asked me how to write this. I made it seem like it was a big deal. So I basically just went in and I, went and I copied these. And I said, file, new. I deleted whatever is in here that I don't understand. I did that. And then I hit Enter. And I did it again. And I was like, if you look down here, you can test out your file. Uh, execute. Oh. Oh, look at that. And then it even has shortcut. You don't even have to remember to do this. You can give it a shortcut. So you can say, what would that be? Uh, After Effects people, is it shift page down? Let's say shift page down. So if I want to do a shortcut, it's just shift page down. I can assign it. Now when I'm in here, I can just hit shift page down. Do the same thing going forward. I sent him the, the, the scripts. And he was like, oh my god, how did you do that? And it's like, literally, it's just taking what you do and just being able to basically put it into a macro or use an action. Um, and you can even get so far as that you can even um, load an icon. And I think somewhere in here, I actually made a really ugly looking icon. Um, yeah. So you can even assign little shortcuts, like little icons in there as well. So you can feel like it's a real tool. Um, and it stores it once you save it there. So um, creating custom actions again, working smarter, not harder, not doing dumb things over and over and over. This can get really complicated. Like at work, we actually, um, I don't know how many people use other 3D programs, but one of the biggest things I'm missing right now in cinema are render overrides. So like, say you have a scene and you want to apply one material to the whole scene, or your, your auditioning texture. So you have three ideas for a character, what the skin could look like, and it's a pain to try to assign it to all the different objects. Um, using just a little bit of Python, which I didn't know, but I had a guy who came by, we have a Python tools developer, and it took him, I'm not kidding, 30 seconds to write two lines that I didn't understand. We basically rent, like, created our own object like render override um, with a little bit of Python. So if you know Python at all or know someone that, it, that is good at it, make them your best friend because you can create tools that I wouldn't say automate but really help you out a lot. Um, going hand in hand with what we just talked about, this is more of being a good neighbor to other people you work with. Um, I lead a lot of teams with three or four people and people will change their shortcuts to the point where I can't even sit at their computer and do anything because it's so customized. So they may have come from Maya and they make their, their Cinema 4D feel like Maya. Or they've just been using it for 10 years and they have their shortcuts that are super fast. If you do use a lot of shortcuts, this is my plea bargain to anybody out there. When you go, and I just showed how you go to customize, customize commands, um, let's just find something that has a shortcut. If there's anything in here, so let's say, I don't even know what catalogs does, but let's say catalogs. Say you use catalogs all the time. And in another program, catalogs is like Control-Alt-Shift-C. If I hit assign right now, it blows that out. So if I'm your supervisor and I come and I sit down and I'm trying to do catalogs and I hit C, I'm totally lost. And imagine every single command is different. If you set up custom shortcuts, I'm going to go back and put it to the default. Just C and assign it. So this is the default you have. If when you do it, if you could just do this little button that's directly underneath the sign that doesn't hurt anything, that's just called add, it just adds it to the list. So instead of blowing out C, it just adds that on top of it. Me as your potential director or supervisor or anyone you else will work with, they will appreciate this so much because you can have your commands, but he can have his, he or she can have his on there as well. So it's a small thing, but this is like a good neighbor policy. Just hit add instead of assign. It doesn't hurt anybody. How are we doing? How many minutes do we got? We got eight minutes, eight minutes. Let's see how many, I'm at 13. I'm running at an all time low. This is super slow. All right, so this um, time slider shortcut, I work with a lot of um, amazing, amazing artists at Imaginary Forces. And I've only been using this for two years. There's people at the company that have been using it for like 15. And then I can't tell you how many times I'll be walking by and someone will be there. And three minutes will go by and I'll just be sitting there just watching them, just like, I don't know how you're doing that. And then I'll scare them because I'll actually just like be there. But there's this guy who um, was doing something. And he was basically, he had his slider up here. And let's see, I have this other file. So uh, there's a reason why it's called the Force is Strong with this trick. Um, let me turn this off and turn this on. Um, let's see. And get to my default camera. Uh, 
All right, so I've got this. I told you there's going to be a lot of cubes. There's nothing pretty in this, but hopefully there's good tricks. Um, so he was up here. One thing I hate, um, I do a lot of 2D animation, and there's a thing called pencil mileage. Like when you draw, you don't want a lot of detail in your characters. You can draw a lot of drawings. And in, um, in cinema, I like to call it wrist mileage. Like there's a lot of times when you're working up here, and then you have to come all the way down here, and then you come all the way over here, and you're bouncing around the screen all the time. Um, and especially here, like if I want to just see what this animation is doing and then tweak something in my attributes, I'm going across the screen so much. And I had a guy who was working, and he's just working up here, and they just did this. Let's see if it's actually going to work. He did this, I'm like, wait, wait, how is he doing that? How is he sliding back and forth? And um, he's like, dude, it's like, I'm a Jedi. He's like, I'm just a, just, I'm a Jedi. I've said this joke a bunch of times, so I apologize. I'm like, what do you mean you're a Jedi? Like, how do you do that? Like, I want to do that. He's like, dude, just remember J. J's for Jedi. I'm like, what does that even mean? And he's like, oh, if you hold down J anywhere in the viewport, and there's something wonky with my, it's like something with, weird with the Wacom pen, but if you try this at home, it shouldn't go that fast. But you can literally hold down J, and anywhere in the cinema uh, viewport, you can scrub your timeline without having to use the shortcuts or come all the way back down here, slide it, lose your train of thought, and come back up here. So always remember J. But the weird thing about it is, as much as I love the developers of Maxon, sometimes they name things things that make no sense to me. So the other thing I'll sit and do, like I think I was saying earlier, is that sometimes I'll just look through here just to see what stuff has shortcuts, because there's tools that seem to show up here that I don't know where they're at. Um, I happen to one day be looking up time warp. I don't know what the hell time warp actually means until I learned this chick, the trick with J. And I actually, like the way I did it was I, I did shortcut filter, because I'm like, I know the shortcut's J. I don't know what it's called. So it's called the time warp. I don't know why it's called that, but it's a great tool that I, for a year and a half, I never knew, and it's really, really helpful. Um, all right. Has anybody used that before? Anybody? OK, good, cool. I love that that's the one that somehow people find out. So this is another big one for me. Smarter parenting. Don't look like me and go bald pulling out animation out of hierarchy. So we all use nulls all the time, right? And a lot of times what will happen is, say you do an animation. I'll just make a new file. And again, it'll be our amazing boxes. But let's say, say we do an animation, turn this on. Okay, this is barely going to qualify as animation, but I'm just going to move here. And then I'm going to go a few more frames up. I'm going to move up, right? Imagine this is a great animation. Um, but let's say your supervisor comes over and he's like, hey, uh, that's great, but that box needs to be um, 50 feet over and 50 feet up. What do we all do? We all go and we either make a null and we drag it into the null and then we take the null and we move that. And then our animation is still you know, moving the way it should, but it, we can change it to where it's in space. Um, or if you know a few more shortcuts, which took me forever, if you hit Alt-G, it'll automatically put it under a null, and then you can take the null and move it. You know, same thing, not a big deal. But the nice thing about it is you, know, like you can rotate it, and the cube will still do its animation, but it's now um, relative to its parent. What happens when you need to take that out of the hierarchy for some reason? What do we all do? We all go through and we drag it out. And you already noticed that that curve changed. And then the moment, maybe you don't do it right away, but the moment you move a keyframe, everything, I won't say what I normally say, screws up. And all of a sudden, it's back to the center of the world. It's not where it should have been. Why does it do that? You know, and if I undo it and I make sure it's still in the hierarchy, you know, like, then it's still, it's still where it should be. But why, why would it do that? Um, it's because we're dealing with different spaces. Our objects, if they're not parented to anything, are still parented, but they're parented to the world space. So as soon as we put them underneath an object, they're relative to wherever that parent is at. This happens in After Effects, in Maya, everything that you work with. But how do we get it out? How do we take it out of the hierarchy? Um, again, there's a tool here that is in a really weird spot that a lot of people are scared to death of, just like I'm scared of scripting. A lot of people are scared of character animation. They would never go into character, command, and scroll all the way down to see this thing called unparent. So you saw what happened if I do this, right? I do that, and I move, and then it jumps, and everything's screwed up. But if you just use a simple command that I now dock in my viewport all the time, you go character, commands, unparent. As soon as you do that, see how it's no longer part of the null? It's above. But when I scrub through, it stays where it was supposed to be at. Now I use this every day, a 1,000 times a day, all the time, because I can put it wherever I need to. But if I need, don't need it in that hierarchy, or that cube now needs to be in a more complicated hierarchy, I don't have to worry about the fact that it was under a null. So it's a big one for me. Let's see. Let's see how fast I can go. Ah, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be done. Is that it? I think my time is up here. <laughs> awesome. So I, th I think I'm pretty much just about done. Um, anybody have any questions about any of that? That was really, I went way too slow. Um, 
I, let me open it back up. I'll show you the other ones I have. Because I don't know, is everybody going to be here or anybody going to be here tomorrow? Nobody? That's it. Huh. Well, let me show you so you can text me or email me or hit me up on Twitter to um, see if you want to see the rest of them. So I have, I think I have 50 of these, and I think I unfortunately only got through. I was slower than I was before. I got through 15. So this is really 50 in like 500 minutes, not 50 in 50 minutes. What's up? I think I got through 48, 48 of them. And, and to be honest, I think they just got put up on Cineversity or on Vimeo, I think in the last two days, I think so. So most of them are up there, but um, you can find me on Twitter. If, there's, if you saw these or there's any questions on them or if there's any ones that like, you wanted me to explain that I didn't explain, let me know and I can, I can make a tutorial or a video really quickly. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in here. There's, um, the, a big one for me is baking clones. I don't know how many people have tried to bake stuff but there's like eight different places to try to bake stuff into timeline. There's a timeline bake, there's a MoGraph cache tag, there's a cache for individual things, there's a cache for the entire scene file. There's a million different ways. But one of the problems I have is basically doing number 17. Um, one of the problems I have is caching something, but then still having it available to be moved around or to adjust after the fact. Um, so I, I'll go through that tomorrow. It's also online. Um, but if you have questions, I'll set up the demo station as long as you guys need to. Um, but I go through a lot of stuff with animation. There's probably like five or six things about lighting. Um, I talk a lot about the new modeling tools, um, a little bit about MoGraph, um, and then just extra tools that I know about, extra tools. You see, I, I use layers religiously. Like you can see here, I use them just as like a trick just to be able to show the presentation. Um, but one thing that I think is absolutely mandatory is um, if you go online, I'll, I, I'll give this guy um, props every time. There's a script called Mute Layers. Just look up Mute Layers, and um, the guy's name that wrote this is High Poly, H-Y-P-O-L-Y. Basically, what it lets you do is, you, in cinema, you know, you can kind of like click and drag vertically, and you can kind of change stuff really quickly. Like I can say, you know, whatever I do here, do it to everything underneath it. Um, you can do that in your layer manager, but you can only do it vertically, which isn't really that helpful. What I want to do is be able to say like, okay, I need to hide this opening title and go to the next one. If I click and drag, it doesn't turn them off. It just does the first one. Um, what this uh, script lets you do, mute layers, is I have it assigned to a shortcut, but it basically just lets you turn everything off in one button press. So I have this one, and I think because I installed it, I have to put the shortcut back in there. But basically, if you go user scripts and mute layers, you can see how it turns everything off in one button press. If you use layers at all, um, people like to say Cinema 4D doesn't have a fast viewport which is not true. Um, when we were doing Pacific Rim, if I took one Pacific Rim model and collapsed everything, like every screw, every bolt, millions of polygons, I could rotate around, I could hit play with my camera, and it'd be fine. But if I made a cloner with nothing more than boxes, but I made a thousand boxes, which is what does everybody do when they start playing with cinema? They put boxes in a cloner and make as many as they can. Cinema slows down to a halt if you try to animate or if you hit play. But it's because the, the viewport doesn't have a problem. It's very fast. The object manager isn't optimized for multiple objects. It's optimized for a couple of objects with lots and lots and lots of polygons. Um, but one of the tricks to cinema is that if you use layers, if you turn anything off with a layer, you know, like I have, uh, turn this on. So I have this, imagine this is like 50,000 little boxes. If I turn this off, look, if I actually say, don't show it in the viewport, Cinema does not even know that those boxes are in the viewport. If you hide them in the object manager, Cinema will still, remember I said it evaluates from the top to the bottom, it will evaluate it and then it will hide it. So when you play, it'll be really slow. But if you hide them with the layer, it won't even know that they're there and your frame rates will jump right back up. The other big trick, um, I don't even know if trick is the right word. Let's see if I, um, whenever you're animating, let's see if I have one of my Pacific Rim files. I think I do. I'm just gonna keep going until they tell me to stop. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, where is, so I brought my, where is it at, might be, I might have to play it off of this so it'll be even better to show how slow it is. So this was the final shot in um, Pacific Rim. And it's, this is playing off a USB drive so it might totally break, I don't know. Um, so we basically had this final shot that starts from the eye of Otachi and works past every single character that was in the movie to give them each like a hero moment. and. Um, I don't know, let me hit, let me get the HUD and see what the FPS is gonna be on this. Um, so there's a lot of polys, and these are the low poly ones, these are proxies, but it's still playing, I don't know how fast this computer is, it's playing pretty fast. I wish I had this computer when we were working on it, actually. 
Um, so the other thing we do a lot of times is we'll use proxies. So we'll take the low poly ones, put them where they need to be, and then at render time, swap them. Um, but this is rendering pretty quick. Um, but one of the reasons it's rendering pretty quick in the viewport is that um, I don't know how many people change their view styles, but I came from Softimage before I was working in cinema. And um, I always use hidden line mode. But, um, and this doesn't have any of the textures on it. But it's actually playing pretty fast. If this had textures, this would probably be playing at like 12 to 15 frames a second. Um, but one of the ways that I also, do, besides using layers, is that I almost exclusively, while I'm doing camera work, before I do lighting, work in hidden line mode. So that basically means in display, I always use hidden line. And you can speed up your viewport pretty dramatically. Another little trick for, for speeding up your viewport is um, I think by default, all frames is turned on. Think. Do you remember, Glenn? I think it's on by default. Like Cinema's trying to show you every single frame. And again, it's not making a bit, I thought this would slow the machine down. Um, but if you ever get to the point where you just want to see your stuff play at the correct frame rate, um, you can turn, go down here and turn off all frames. Like if you're chugging at like eight or 10 frames per second, clicking this guy and just turning off all frames will give you, you can see it boosted up to like 63 from like 30. Um, because it will skip frames, but it will always try to match your frame rate. So if you're, you're saying you're working at 30, it'll always try to play as fast as it can. And if it means it has to skip a couple just to get smooth playback, it'll do that. Um, so that's kind of like a little speed boost is use hidden line, turn off all frames, and you should see a little bit more um, quicker viewport. Is that it? Call me whenever you need me to call me. I'll go. I can go till tonight, till five. One minute. One minute? Oh, I don't know. Are there any questions in a minute? Anything? Nothing? Okay. Um, yeah, come by tomorrow. Stop by over there. Um, I think you've seen my... I think you've seen my Twitter handle probably more times than you care to, but um, it is the dumbest name of all time. Let's see, where is it at? Oh, it's not even on here. Is it on here? It's, uh, it's Otter Nod. I think, oh, let's see, it might be on, I have 30 seconds to figure out how to show this. Let's see. There, is it on here? There, it's that. That's not me, by the way. The amount of people that think this is me is ridiculous. They're scared to talk to me. People are literally afraid to talk to me because of that. Um, but yeah, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know if you have questions. Thanks. I think that's it. Thank you, guys.